Good morning, Messiah. Good morning, Messiah. Happy friends and family day. Happy friends and family day. Before we get into it, I want somebody out there to say, it's coming. No, no, you got to say it like you mean it. Say it with some conviction. It's, it's coming. It's coming. All right. I know you think I was talking about a blessing, but I wasn't. I wasn't. I wasn't. It's coming. An opportunity for you to show Pastor McGee how much you love him. <laughs> yeah. It's coming. It's coming. It's, it's vastly approaching. The time is, is, is coming. It's rapidly coming. This month is almost over, and we're about to enter into the eighth month of the year. And I, I know some of you may be sitting there feeling a little weird about it, right? It's you know, giving an anniversary gift. Okay, don't worry. I'm going to take that away from you. Give him a birthday gift, right? Right? You don't like anniversaries? That's okay. Give him a birthday gift, right? You have two chances in a month of August to show your pastor how much you love him monetarily. I, I, I said it. If you're mad about it, get mad at me. It's okay, all right? All right? It's coming. It's coming. I was, I was thinking for friends and family day, though, uh, as a passage, Proverbs 18, 24, it says, there's a friend that, that, that sticks closer than, than, a, than a brother. Uh, there's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. We, the family that I grew up in, we, we had a bit of a rule uh, instituted by my uncle. Uh, it was one fight, all fight. Uh, one fight, all fight. Uh, and it was frustrating because some cousins I hung out with, some people I hung out with because I ain't had no brothers, right? And we went out and it was fine. Everything was good. We, we played ball, we, we went to the movies, and we came back without incident, right? Without incident. But I had one cousin, w one, one, right? It, it didn't matter where we went, we fought. And because if one fight, all fight, it wasn't optional to get involved. So we had started prepping him before, like, look, bro, we going to the court. You know they're going to push you. It's going to be okay because we didn't want to fight. But if one fight, I'll fight because we couldn't come back into the home and, and, and give our uncle the report that somebody had a fight. Because the next question was going to be after did he win was did you help? And, and, and I wasn't willing to have to fight him. So if one fault, all fault. I know I'm, I'm going somewhere. I'm going, I'm going somewhere. Don't, don't, don't. I, I, I assume that Jesus grew up in the same household that I grew up in. Let, let me explain. Because Jesus has taken on the mentality when it comes to his children that when one fight... <laughs> Oh, 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 you missing it when, when, when one, when one goes through, I'll, 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 I'll go, I'll go through. Oh, when, when one suffers, oh, uh, may, maybe you missed the scripture that says this battle is not yours, it's the Lord. See, that's Jesus taking on the mentality when one fight, I'll, I'll fight. And when he saw the fighting getting too tough, he saw the, the, the battle getting too hard, he climbed up the V Della Rosa. He took that road of blood to Calvary because Jesus has the mentality that when one fight, we all, we all fight. But beloved, I don't know where you are today. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your heart is. But Jesus is a better fighter than you. Stop fighting on your own. This battle isn't yours. It belongs to the Lord. And he is willing to go all in. Stand toe to toe with whatever you're dealing with. Because when one fight. That's all I got. That's all I got. Happy friends and family day.
Jeremiah chapter 9. I want to read in your hearing verses 23 through 24. Jeremiah chapter number 9. And when you get it, say, I've got it. If you're still looking, say, I'm still looking. that you bow with me in a word of prayer. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. There is none like you. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We think of you today for who you are and we thank you today for the things that you have done. It is our prayer that you get the glory out of our gathering and it is our prayer that you please preside over the preaching with precision, with passion, and with power. For you know the frailty of our frames and the fragility of our forms. Again, we ask that you pardon us for our guilt, protect us with your goodness, provide for us with your grace, persuade us with your gospel, and pour out your gift. Make your word believable and receivable. May these, your people, be receptive as well as responsive to your holy word. Holy Spirit, this is your time to have your way to do your thing. Think with my mind and speak with my mouth. You are the real preacher. Continue, O oh God, to convince, convict, and convert us into the conformity of Christ. Forgive us all our sins. And we thank you for what you have done. And we trust you for what you're going to do. It is in the strong name of Jesus that we pray. Thank God. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, there you shall find these words recorded for your listening as they have been translated in the English Standard Version. As long as you got a holy Bible with just 66 books in it, you're doing just fine, but this is what my Bible says. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. And just for a little while, I'll put a tag on this text and talk on this topic today about bragging rights. Bragging rights. <laughs> Sisters and brothers, there was once a successful man who said he owed his success uh, to a close study of some observations that he made of his Dominicker rooster. Those of you from of a more agrarian culture are pretty much familiar with that. Before a time when, and if you please excuse me, that animals had more rights than humans do, they used to have what was called cockfights. And you would train your rooster, make some blades or shards and strap them to their feet, throw them in the ring to fight another rooster, and the best chicken won. Now this usually ended in the demise of the defeated chicken on most cases and so it was outlawed because again animals these days have more rights than humans do and I don't get me wrong I love animals but this successful man knew that his rooster was a powerful fighter but after he got a few wins a few W's, a few victories under his belt of feathers. He knew that 
that he could fly higher and cut deeper than any other opponent that he was faced with in this circuit of cockfights. But it was discovered by his owner that he often lost fights against weaker opponents. And as his owner studied this, he knew that he learned that his trouble was that right in the middle of a fight, he would stop to start crowing, cock-a-doodle-doo. And when he stopped to start crowing, his weaker foe would overtake him. Now, sisters and brothers, there's nothing wrong with having a little pride. Nothing wrong with having self-confidence. Nothing wrong with being sure of oneself, as long as it doesn't come off as offensive. We're living in a time where this nation is led by number 46 minus one. <laughs> number 46 minus one has been the most unpresidential president in U.S. history. He's a blowhard. He loves to brag. And he rewrote the temptation song that says, I ain't too proud to beg. And he calls it, I ain't too proud to brag. And he gets on every news media outlet and network and he touts on about this, that, and the other. And if anybody disagrees with him, there's trouble. Trouble. There's always some media firestorm, and he takes to Twitter in the midnight hour to attack and to make awful comments and statements and stirs up stadiums full of crowds just because people disagree with him. Because he brags about the economy has gone up, unemployment has gone down, but if you pay attention to current events in our country, these things happened or took began to happen under the Obama administration. And I'm not biased in any of the conclusions or statements, conclusions I've come to or statements that I make. These are just facts. And so he was dovetailed into an upswing of improved ways of living. He sets the tone for a lot of people in this country, and we are yet to be considered as a United States of America uh, because of his assertions, because of his uh, political posturing. More has been done over the last 24 plus months to undermine the unity of our nation than to bring it together. If you pay attention, uh, most uh, people, the news media, uh, and a lot of people who are career politicians, they wear a lot of purple nowadays. Purple is symbolic of a wedding of blue and red. When you blend those two colors together, you get purple. And so they do this in an attempt to give the appearance of unity because Democrats are blue, Republicans are red. And so to give the appearance of unity, people wear purple nowadays. 
so as to indicate or symbolize that we should be united. When I look at what is happening in our country, it cannot help me and others to think about what was going on in Judah during the time of this text. They had the same kind of problems uh, that citizens, leaders of this country have today. They had overinflated egos. Some would suggest rightly so, because they had a long history of success in spite of themselves, but it was not because of themselves. It was because of God. It was because of a promise that God made a man at the time named Abram. And they were now seemingly enjoying the fruits of his labor and every patriarch that followed in the footsteps of this promise. So now that they got sealed houses, now that everyone could sit under his fig tree, look out at his vineyards and olive groves, count the herds, count the cattle and the flocks. They can look at what the NASDAQ report and the Dow Jones was. Everything was supposedly on an upswing. And even though their close relatives in the North had serious political troubles with the Assyrians slowly driving them away. They thought that because they were in the spiritual capital of Palestine and that they would be all right because of who they were and not considering whose they were. Again, I tell you, they were blessed in spite of themselves. And if they had taken the time to do an inventory of their blessings, every tally mark, every hash mark, every check box would point to God. And they boasted on their military strength. They were not the biggest nation, did not have the biggest army of men. But what secured their borders, what kept them for these centuries up until the time of the text was not the footmen, was not their horses, their chariots, was not their swords, their shields, their spears, or their bowls, but it was because they had a dispatch of heavenly hosts that God would send to fight on their behalf. It was not because they were the most academic nations. They were not known like other ethnic groups for any real discoveries, for any breakthroughs in indigenous culture, not much really, and I don't mean this in any wrong way, not much really points back to them as far as anything eclectic is concerned. To the world, yes, they were the school of religion. But their error was that they did not bring people to God by being a light for him. And so they weren't the brightest crayons in the box. 
And so they, they could in no wise say that their success was achieved by their knowledge or their acumen. They could not brag about their riches, their money, because united we stand, but divided we saw. And since the separation of the northern tribes and the southern tribes, there was a breakdown in their economic ability. They did what they wanted to do in the north, which amounted to little. And slowly but surely, that nation declined because of Assyrian conquest. And now the news reports are reading that Egypt is on the rise as well as Babylonia. I don't know if they knew, but history would suggest that what happened to the Egyptians under Moses, God promised that you will never have to worry about the Egyptians again. But they didn't look at things from a spiritual perspective. And so they were paying protection money to the Egyptians and even to the Babylonians, not realizing, because they weren't that smart, that they were funding and providing resources for the very people who would one day conquer them. So it wasn't their money that was keeping them safe and allowing them to live the way they want to live within their comfortable borders. No, all of their blessings, all of their breakthroughs came from the Lord. And whenever people get off track, God always sends a witness so that the people can hear, thus saith the Lord. He calls one at an early age by the name of Jeremiah. Jeremiah's name meant something. And just like any respecting Jew at the time. They did not name abstract or trendy names, but they gave them names depending on how they viewed God and life. And the name Jeremiah means appointed by God. And from the time that we are introduced to him in his biopic book, we know that he tries to live up to his name. Now, it's one thing to be appointed, but it's quite another to walk in the appointment. It's one thing to be assigned, but it's another thing to walk in the assignment that you have. I'm not your pastor because of who I am. I'm your pastor because of what I do. And here it is, he was appointed by Jehovah for such a time as this. He had a long ministry, which lasted for 41 years. His ministry lasted over a span of four kings, King Josiah, King Jehoaz, King Jehoiachin, King Jehoiakim, and King Zedekiah. 41 years of kings. He ministered and he preached. And his ministry did not end at his death, but it ended at the time of Jerusalem's destruction in 586 B.C. And then after that, he decides to write another book calling it Lamentations because he had a whole lot to cry about. This Jeremiah was pious. And like many that we find to be prophets and a particular people in the scriptures, he was a priest. 
Now the priest's responsibility, sisters and brothers, is that they were ordained to serve God on behalf of the people. And what we take for granted in our relationship with Jesus is our, the priesthood, the royal priesthood, let's call it, of the believer. That means, I don't mind when you do, that if you decide to have a talk with God, you don't need my permission to do it. Or you don't have to ask me to go to God on your behalf. Because your royal priesthood of your believership means that if you are a believer, you can go to God for yourself. And I encourage that you do. But he was born of the priestly line and he was ordained to serve God on behalf of the people. But also he was a, a prophet. Not all priests are prophets and not all prophets are priests. But this Jeremiah was both a priest and a prophet. And a prophet is ordained to speak to the people on God's behalf. You see the difference, don't you, a priest? The people, the priest, he serves God on the people's behalf. But a prophet serves, serves God on the people's behalf. As a priest, he talked to God for the people. But as a prophet, he talked to the people for God. So he has piety. That's what we automatically know about him. But then he was prosperous. Because he was prosperous, when you read his story, read through the chapters of Jeremiah, you see him purchasing some expensive things, like real estate. That is because he was resourceful with possessions so that he could conduct expensive transactions. He hired a scroll, a, a scribe, to write down his words in scrolls. And in order to hire a scribe, that means that you had to have some money to buy real estate and to make it and procure important purchases. He was resourceful, so that tells us he was prosperous. But also, sisters and brothers, he was prodigious because he was called at an early age. Now, it's one thing to be saved at an early age. That's about most of us in here. But it's another thing to be called at an early age. Uh, I would assume that God looked around, didn't see any full-grown men who would be bold and courageous enough to take the stand that he needed. And he called Jeremiah. Yeah. And with reluctance, Jeremiah uh, complained to God, saying, I'm just a kid, man. You want me to do what? You want me to say what? You want me to go where? I'm, I'm, I'm just a kid. He said, I know that. He said, before your mama even had you, boy, I'm the one who formed you in your mother's womb. And I ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. And he said, when you stand before the people, if they roll their eyes at you, you roll your eyes back at them. If they wag the finger at you, you wag the finger back at them. In other words, God was telling him, you don't have to be afraid. Go where I send you and say what I tell you to say. And everything will be all right. Again, he served under four to five kings and outlasted and outlived most of them. Because he was God's appointed man for the job. He was a passionate man as well. And because he was passionate about the message that God gave him, 
Uh, he would preach it with boldness and with clarity. Uh, he saw visions. And the visions that he saw helped him to understand God's perspective when it came to his people in Judah. On one occasion, God told him, I, I want you to go on a field trip. He said, the ends justify the means. I'm going somewhere. He says, when you get there, go to the potter's house. And when you get there, tell me what you see. You'll see a potter working, a vessel on the wheel. And when he gets done spinning his wheel around and shaping it, he looks it over. He steps back. He steps up. He looks from different angles. He turns it around. And he looks for imperfections. And if he sees any imperfections, he's going to, before he bakes it hard, he's going to tear that down, start over again, until it comes out the way that he needs it to come out. And when he saw that potter fashioning the clay on the wheel, tore it down to build it back up, he said, now what you get out of the field trip? What's, what's, what's your takeaways? He said, well, it could be my people are like that. Your people are like that. They got some flaws. They're marred. They're misconstructed. And so they just need to be broken down and built back up. Now, that is very interesting because if we need fixing, who are you going to choose or trust to fix you? Because if you don't let God fix you, God's going to use somebody else to fix you for him. They would not voluntarily submit themselves because in order to get something fixed, you got to first believe that it's broken. And they didn't believe that they were broken. And so God looked at them as marred clay. You, you're not even ready to go into the, the kiln, into the oven, so that you can be solidified into permanent shape. And so he was passionate because he wanted the people to be molded in God's hands and not in the hands of someone God would use to chasten them. He was perseverant. Yes, leadership has its woes. Preaching comes at a price. And the premium is often very steep and very high. Do you not know that many studies, Gallup and Barna polls, produce re results of staggering numbers of pastors who suffer from deep depression? Because it's a very challenging undertaking. It really is. And you know, like I know, people just don't know how to stay off your last two nerves. Why do you think pastors are leaving their churches? I mean, packed churches, three, four services a weekend. It's from depression. Why do you think they try medicinal means? Drugs and addictions of choice. They are depressed. Many others have paid the ultimate cost by taking their own lives. Because they are depressed. And all of the time people, they can call the pastor. But who do the pastor have to call? They can call their preacher and unload and upload and download all of their problems. But who does the preacher have to talk to? 
Yeah, God, I know, I, I, I see you sitting there. But God does the preacher like he does you. Sometimes he's just silent on subject matters. Amen, somebody. You've been around the body of Christ long enough. The choir just sang a song talking about I was in the spirit. God told me some things. God showed that. That's rare. That don't happen all the time. And so when it do happen, you need to pay close attention to it. That's not something that occurs every day. There are those times when God is just silent on subjects. And unfortunately, the unwitting preacher pastor takes matters into his own hands. And so it's noteworthy to find those who are perseverant because we find him being perseverant. Now, before you try the pastor preacher out in the court of your opinion, let me tell you, Paul got depressed. Peter got depressed. Moses got depressed. David got depressed. Elijah and Elisha got depressed. And I can go on and on, but let me get to the granddaddy of them all. Even Jesus Christ got depressed. Because folk will get on your last to nerve. He got depressed and said, God, here's your Bible back. God, here's your notebooks back. God, here's your license back. God, here's your ordination certificate back. God, here, take all your stuff, because I ain't going nowhere. I ain't doing nothing. And I ain't preaching to nobody. Because I didn't ask for this. I was on my skateboard one day, and here you come talking about go be a preacher. I didn't have a chance to grow up, enjoy my childhood. You stole my life from me. And to add injury to insult, I got a handful of members, and I did all this preaching. Blessed all these babies. Did all these eulogies, performed all these weddings, and all I get is just a hand full of members. And so I'm tendering my resignation as of this very hour. And he leaves, and then he sits down and get a case of acid reflux. Goes to CVS and gets him some antacids. That don't calm it down. Took a, stink, a spoonful of baking soda, put it in some water, stirred that up. That didn't calm it down. Took him a sip of apple cider vinegar. That didn't calm it down. Because it was not ordinary heartburn. Tried to go to bed at night tossing and turning. Sweating and crying. And then he came to himself, I feel like preaching. Because it's like a fire that's burning within me. All shut up in my bowls. And he says, I'm tired of trying to keep it in. I, I'm tired of trying to keep it in. I got to preach and I got to get it out. I got to pray and I got to get it out. I got to praise and I got to get it out. So God, let me have all that stuff back. Because I'm going to need it after all. But then, beloved, he was also penetrating. Because he was in touch with the situation. He was not... Just one who was casual about the situation. He was very much interested in the improvement 
of his people's relationship with God. And whenever they would do too much, whenever they would ignore the commandments, the warnings that, that he would herald to them, it would cause him to go somewhere and weep. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. In fact, when you get home, start reading verse number one and read down to the rest of the chapter. It is there he, we find him weeping about the overall situation that Judah is facing at this time. Uh, he concluded when God spoke to him that they had a problem with their inflated egos, or shall I say over-inflated ego. It's funny, thank you Holy Spirit, that the Greek word for I is ego. I'm going to let that marinate just for a little while. That's the Greek word for I, ego. That's why when people have ego problems, it's an I problem. It's really not a problem with anybody else, but it indicates that it's a problem with one's individual self. So there was a nation filled with egomaniacal individuals that believed that they were successful because they pulled them, their own selves up by their own bootstraps. So there are timeless truths that are trapped within the treasury of this text. It's a tale to teach us that God is the fountain of all good things. Man is merely an instrument by which a portion of this good is distributed in the earth. Therefore, none shall glory in his wisdom. None shall glory in his might. None shall glory in his riches or etc. Because all glory belongs to God. The text gives us, first of all, bragging that is prohibited. This is the first of my only two little points. Bragging that is prohibited. Anything that's prohibited is something that you're not supposed to do. It says in verse 23, not that Jeremiah says this, he gets it from God. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches. You know what? E.C. McKenzie puts it this way, he says, few people need voice lessons when it comes to singing their own praises. Because we're good at that. We got perfect pitch. We don't need a tuning fork. We don't need the little thing you blow in to get you tuned on. We, when it comes to singing our own praises, where we've been, who we know, what we do, what we got, we are experts in that field. Here it says, Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, he is the one who's speaking to them and to us, saying, stop boasting. Boasting about wisdom, what you know. Boasting about might, what you can do. Boasting about riches, what you can have. Because to boast in the Hebrew means to praise or to brag. So, there are a lot of people who Spend a little time praising God. 
but a whole lot of time praising themselves. Uh-huh. We love patting ourselves on the back. We love tooting our own horns. And that is the reason why we conduct ourselves in the way that we do. You've seen it time before. You ain't received an invitation from a person for anything, but when they get a new place, sending you a saved date, but they want you to see their new place so they can brag and brag. Wait till somebody get a new car. Amen, somebody. They're going to come by and visit you that one time. They're going to offer to pick you up or drop you off that one time. Because they want you to, they want to hear you say, ooh, it got that new car smell in here. Ooh, this, this is so nice. It, it fits you. You, you deserve it. Yeah, that, that's what they want to hear one good time. People love to brag and to be bragged about. They love to hear the praises of men. Now, on occasion, the praises of men is all right. When you do something, it's all right. When you do a good job, your, 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 your manager, your supervisor is supposed to praise you. Your company is supposed to recognize you. When you do well in school, you the teachers and the faculty, they're supposed to recognize you, you know, things like that. In, in ministry, you should be recognized for your commitment and your uh, excellence and service. You should be recognized. And praises of men is all right, but nothing like the praise of God. You cannot beat the praise of God. Praise of God trumps man's praise every time. I would rather, after it all, hear God say, well done, than man to say, well done, a hundred times down here. So don't get caught up in bragging on yourself or allowing others to brag and go on and go on and go on about you. James puts it like this. He puts a prohibition on such boasting. He says in chapter 4, verse 13 through 17, Come now, you say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. And yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your, hear me now, I didn't say it, the Lord says it, arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it is sin. It's a sin to boast and brag. Or to pl plan things prematurely ahead of the Lord. Their problem was they were not wise enough to finagle their way out of their situation. The wisdom that God is talking about was their political savvy, their political sagacity. They thought that they knew how to wheel and deal. Yeah, just get me a seat at the table. And we'll, 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 we'll negotiate. We'll come to terms. Oh, I, I, I'm excellent at making deals. Y'all seen that before? Y'all heard that before? I, I'm, the, I'm the greatest at making deals. Yes, I am. And so they thought that a deal, they could make the deals. Oh, we, we can get the Egyptians to sit down. We can, we can get the Babylonians to leave us alone. Just, just, just get me a seat at the table. I wine them and dine them. I wheel them and deal them. Before long, I have them eating out of the palm of my hand. But 
their wisdom would not be enough to finagle their way out of what was coming. Sisters and brothers, they were not worthy enough to force their way out. That word might means strength. That means military prowess. We have what it takes and who it takes to defend ourselves against any threat, both foreign and domestic. Every battle they won, they had help. If you were fighting Israel, if you were fighting Judah, it was a fixed fight. God would use grasshoppers. God would use darkness. God would use mud. God would use trumpets. All kind of stuff in their history to help them win their little battles. Now, you want to posture your military might. Yeah, we got the most skilled archers. We got the most voracious swordsmen. We got the best horses money could buy. It was not their military prowess. It was because they had the help of the hosts of the Lord Almighty. They were not wealthy enough to finance their way out because those who pay protection money, after a while, it's going to go up. And the one you paying don't care if you can afford to pay it or not. And it was affordable at the time. But sooner or later, it got a little higher. And the current king said, I ain't paying all that like so and so did. They want them to know that, well, they're going to have to just do what they want to do because I'm not paying all of that like my predecessor did. So they really didn't have enough because it was only enough under the current situation. And if things changed on the other end and the incoming ruler wanted more, they would impose more protection money, making it a financial burden that they were not able to keep up with. And without God's help in the area of their pocketbooks, they would not have been in the position to pay anyway. Riches deals with their fortunes, and riches are all right, fortunes are all right. But all of these things are vulnerable to lack or loss. That's why I don't get too comfortable with your cash. Because it's vulnerable to lack or loss. If you're 70 years older or more, raise your hand. And if you're 70 years or more and you don't work, raise your hand or keep your hand up. <laughs> or you don't have to work, you just need something to do. Well, the reason why people in their golden years are working today because of a lot of the economic failures of our corporations that force people to have to work longer because their nest egg got built away by some fools in high places. Oh, watch the show hosted by Stacy Keach called American Greed. And there's a docu-series about the countless times that investors and CEOs and hedge fund uh, uh, dealers and all kinds of people just rob people out of their hard-earned 
savings. Uh-huh. And nothing can be done about it except the person go to jail. Because they didn't, can I say it like I once? They tricked that money off. <laughs> Trips, commodities, the government, they, yeah, they, they seized the pain, but they ain't going to give it to you. They seized the yacht, the cars, the houses all over the country, but they ain't going to give it to you. So you out, and you get the satisfaction after being built out of hundreds of thousands of dollars of your 401k or whatever and retirement vehicle that you have. Oh, he in jail. Yeah, you at work while he in jail. All the Bernie Madoffs ain't serving life sentences. People ain't got money to waste. Work too hard, too long to have money to waste because somebody's fooling around. And all of our money is at the behest of somebody else. We had the behest of the director of finance, chairman of the treasury, U.S. Treasury. We had the behest of the stock exchange. We had the behest of Experion and Equifax. We had the behest of everybody else. And so our cash is vulnerable. Vulnerable to lack or vulnerable to loss. So they believed that they had everything that it took. Wisdom, strength, resources to keep them in the comfort zone that they were used to. They did things, listen, by the world's standards. And even in the first century, when the world was obviously changing, John, uh, the apostle, writes to us in 1 John 2, 15 through 17, do not love the world or the things in the world. Now, let me, let, let, let me, let me be parenthetic in preaching. That don't mean you can't love going fishing, going on a nice vacation in the Caribbean. Doesn't mean that. There are... When it says world, it means systems in play that give a seamless but false appearance of some things. Those, those, those things that are above our, our head and out of our pay grade. Things that make the world go round. So don't get caught up in those things because if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father, listen, is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the prize of life, same stuff that got Adam and Eve in trouble, it is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Uh, Let me make it simple for you. Just do it God's way and not the world's way. Keep your hand in God's hand. Let me put it where you can get it. Bragging, that is prohibited. Like most of you, your senior year, you got your yearbook, didn't you? Senior year of high school, you got your yearbook, didn't you? And like most of you, I viewed my pictures and stories and activities that were found in my yearbook. One day in college, I got homesick, and I got bored. So I pulled my high school yearbook out. That year, 85, we had hoodies before hoodies became a thing. See, see, young folk think y'all made up everything. No, hoodies been around for 30 plus years. So we had a hoodie. My, my, my navy blue hoodie had gold letters, CVI, blue and gold, live in 85. That, that, was, that, was, our, that was our battle cry. That was our, our, our chant for that, that year. So we all 
They, they told us to meet outside on the campus, outdoors. We're going to take a, a photo of the whole class. All seniors meet outside. Nice, not, decent spring day. A little cool, but not too bad. So we all assembled outside. And they had a photographer up on a high tower. And his job was to look down on us, capture all of us, told us to get close together. And he, and he would get all of us in the photo. So, of course, that summer, uh, early in that, that fall, probably the spring semester, I don't remember, just like many of you, I got bored. I got homesick and I wanted to look through my yearbook and cheer myself up. And so that, that photograph was on the inside front and back cover. When you opened that cover up, you saw all those faces on the inside front and back cover. So I flipped it open and I'm looking for myself. Like most of us do, I'm looking for myself. Trying to cheer myself up, and who better to help cheer myself up than myself? And so I'm looking for my picture. I knew who I was next to. I knew who I was standing beside. And I looked, and I looked, and I don't see myself. So I'm getting magnifying glasses at this time, and I'm looking up. So I was standing right here. I know I was standing right here. There's bro bro right there. I'm standing right next to bro bro. Where am I in this picture? So I turn to the back. Maybe I'm on the back. Same spot. Yeah, here's the tree. There's the stone. So yeah, that's bro. bro. Uh -huh. So I zoom in. My magnifying glass. I said, I know I was right there. I'm, I'm cheesing just like everybody else. I'm live in 85 just like everybody else. And I'm not in this picture. I can't wait to get back for Thanksgiving. Because I'm going up to that school and say, I ain't in this picture. Why ain't I in this picture? Well, what happens, because I know photographers who do this professionally, when they take group shots, a lot of times they'll take a panoramic view. That means they'll take a series of pictures and then they will edit them together. Any of you have ever taken a large photo like that? It was, it was, it was 700 and something of us. We, we, it was a large graduating class. So it was 700 and some seniors outside. And so he took a series of pictures. And in the process of editing them together, I got cut out. <laughs> Stood there like everybody else did. Smiled like everybody else smiled. Hollered like everybody else hollered. But I was cut out of the picture. And sisters and brothers, when you brag on yourself, you cutting God out the picture. Can you imagine how I felt when I learned that I was cut out of the picture? I was mad as that thing. I was hot as fish grease. The, 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 the yearbook was, it was horrible. Man, man, our yearbooks was dope. That dope came out around that time. No, this yearbook horrible. I'm all through the book, but I wasn't on the cover where I wanted to be. And when you cut God out of the picture, it is disheartening. It is discouraging for God when we cut him out of the picture of our lives. All the time we're posting up, posturing here and there, and God is nowhere in the picture. Here with them, the toast of the town, they thought it was their wisdom, their strength, and their riches. God wasn't a part of the picture. If God isn't a part of the picture of your life, then he isn't your God. He ain't a part of your picture. He ain't your God. He tells them about bragging that was prohibitive. Then he tells them about bragging that is permitted. Verse 24 tells us, but let him who boasts, let him who brags, brag on this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. This is an envelope statement. 
It starts saying, I said this. And it ends saying, I said this. Jeremiah was the vessel communicating to the people about God. God is permitting us here to brag. But you better know what to brag about and who to brag on. That Hebrew word he uses for understand, it means theoretically, in the intellect, a basic waking knowledge. God speaking of himself, he wants us to understand him in the intellect. Have a basic waking knowledge. What do you mean, preacher? When you wake up in the morning, know, baby, that there's a God somewhere. Yeah. You got a basic waking knowledge. Now, as far as knowing God like the back of your hand, that's not possible. Isaiah 40, somewhere around verse 30 says, there's no searching of his understanding. You can't figure God out. He's incalculable. So you, the least you can have is a basic waking knowledge about God. Then he says, no. And that Hebrew word for no, that's practicality. That's, a, that's to walk in his ways because you understand him as best as you can. You know how to walk in his ways based on his revealed word and the presence of his spirit, and that gives us a basic working knowledge. So you got what you need. You got theory, and then you got practicality. Because knowing a little bit is half the battle, right? You got everything you need to work with to understand these three things. Number one, God's merciful nature has proved to be all-sufficient. He talks about the fact that I'm the Lord who practices steadfast love. That's often translated as mercy. His kindness or his steadfast love, that's a loyal kind of love that endures forever. You missing your shout right now. You don't get that from nobody but God. I wish you'd say amen right here. You don't get that from nobody but God. Folk, you turn on the day, you'll turn them off by tomorrow. Amen, somebody. Oh, I know it's getting quiet in here now. But for whatever reason, here comes your shout. Let me see if you can handle it. You, God, you always turn God on. When you're not at your best, you still do something to the heart of God. When all this manner of foolishness come out your mouth, God still loves you. Hallelujah, somebody, in spite of yourself. And you expect everybody else to be like that. It just ain't gonna happen, brother. Ain't nobody going to love you like the Lord loves you. You can look high and low, doesn't matter where you go. You can look far and wide. Still, you'll never find nobody like the Lord. Lord will rock with you when won't nobody else rock with you. He'll put up with you and won't nobody else put up with you. He wants to be around when you ran everybody else away. He's got a loyal kind of love. And it's all sufficient. God's moderate nature has propelled us beyond our struggle. He talks about justice. I exercise justice. I'm as fair as fair can get. Hallelujah, somebody. 
Raise your hand if you like court TV like I do. I'll catch it when I can. Judge Million, Judge Joe Brown, Judge Mathis, Judge Judy. I love. Because everybody walks into the courtroom thinking they're right. That, that, that's what both parties got in common, the plaintiff and the defendant. They both think they're right. They both believe that they're going to win that particular case, but it's got to be arbitrated by the judge. And I've seen some people derail their chances by being extra. And the judge wasn't having it that day. Hallelujah, somebody. And they decided based on their feeling, not based on the fact. Said something you wasn't supposed to say. Look how you wasn't supposed to look. Fold your arms. Oh, oh, I'm judging from the plaintiff. They don't mean it's right. But that's what goes on in court. But whenever you need justice, God always gives us a fair hearing. Hallelujah. And he's always looking to dispense mercy and to find a way to acquit. But the best thing, here comes your shout. When God judges us according to our sin, no other judge does this. He put it on somebody else. Mm, mm, mm. I never seen Judge Mathis do that. Never seen Joe Brown do that. Never seen Judy Shiland do that. Never seen Jeannie, Janine Pirot do that. All of them, every tub had to sit on their own bottom. But when God judges, he puts it on somebody else. Listen, his own son, he had to put our iniquities, our wickedness, our transgressions upon him. So he could be fair. What are you? He governs justly. A lot of y'all love to shout about. He's a lawyer in the courtroom. I quit saying that. <laughs> Lawyer's all right, but, but the lawyer got to deal with the judge. I, I need the judge. He's a judge in the courtroom, a righteous judge. Listen, there are three, three, three classifications of government, and I'm, I'm going to my seat. It's just liberal, liberal, conservative, and modest. We, we hear this all the time. Those of you that watch CNN and Fox News and all these things and keep in touch with what's going on in the political arena, whether federal or whether local, we, we hear this all the time. Liberals, conservatives, moderates. A liberal is, they, they support progressive ideas. That's what they do. They value relating equality supported by institutions that defend against extreme economic inequality. They believe in democracy, civil liberties, and the rule of law. The conservatives, they promote, they maintain, they support traditional institutions, allowing minimal or gradual change in society, i.e., they want to keep stuff the same. Old stuff works, time honored. Time, time tested. That's how they are. Some conservatives seek to preserve things that the way they are emphasizes stability and continuity, which other conservatives oppose modernism and seek to return to the things the way they are. Grand old party. They are conservatives. That's why they can make statements like, they can get behind stuff like, we're going to make America great again. All oh, this stuff that didn't happen the last eight years, we got to make it back great again. No, it was great three years ago. We just didn't know how to appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Hallelujah, somebody. Moderates, on the other hand, are individuals or groups who are not extreme. They are not partisan. They are neither radical, neither left-wing or right-wing. They just roll with 
what's right for everybody. And that's what God's position is. That's how his nature is. Uh, he's moderate by nature. And that is the reason why we've come out of so many struggles uh, in our lives because of God's uh, moderate type of attitude toward us. He just wants what's right and what's best for everybody. That's why he can make statements like Romans 8, 28 and all things he works for the good of those who love him to them who are called according to his purpose. Then lastly, God's moral nature has the potential to be our strength. It talks about his righteousness, that is conforming to a standard or a norm, again, that is good for all. Jesus put it like this. He makes the sun shine on the fields of the just and the unjust. He makes the rain fall on the evil as well as the good. Amen, somebody. It's fair out here how things got set up there. For everybody. He, he, wants e he wants everything to work out for everybody's good. And if you trust him, it may not look like it sometimes. It may not feel like it sometimes. But if you trust him, it'll work out for your good. He said, if you understand this, if you know something about me. He said, these are the things that I delight in. In. The Hebrew word that means something that you take pride and pleasure in. God said, if you're going to brag, put me at the front of the line. Before you start talking about yourself, before you start talking about your child, before you start talking about your boo, put me at the head of the line. On your playlist of praises, put me at the top. Prioritize your bragging in such a way that everybody knows that if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, where would I be? Grew up listening to lots of kinds of music growing up, blues. Jazz, they played everything in our house, in our village. Some classic rock, some pop music, disco, played everything in our village. One of my favorite songs growing up was by KC and the Sunshine Band. He said, that's the way, uh-huh, uh-huh. I like it, uh-huh, uh-huh. I don't know no other words of that song, but that's the way. And when it comes to God, as far as praise is concerned, that's the way he likes it. As far as bragging is concerned, that's the way he likes it. Can you say, uh-huh? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make a boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be made glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. That's the way he likes it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Psalm 44 and 8 says, in God, we have boasted continually. And we will give thanks to your name forever. That's the way he likes it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes, sir, Paul even says that we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God. Mm-hmm. And glory in Christ Jesus, putting no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have a reason for putting confidence in the flesh. He says if anyone else thinks he has reason, 
or for confidence. He says, I have more. He said, let me slip you my resume. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as the righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the all-surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ mm -hmm. and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Yeah, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And may share in his sufferings. Becoming like him in his death. That by all means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. That's the way I like it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. God doesn't mind you brag, but put him at the head of the line. The next time you brag about your house, tell somebody this is God's house. And he's welcome in my house. But the question is, is he welcome in your heart? Because verse 25 and 26 tell the story about how God said, you circumcise all right. But it's a circumcision of the flesh and not a circumcision of the heart. And any good respecting Jew knew that circumcision was special to God because it separated you from being like everybody else. But when you get home and you read the whole chapter, you'll see he lines them up with some other no good nations, saying all of y'all the same way to me because you don't have it in the right place. When you have it in your heart, everything will be all right. See, some of our praise is just in our hands. Whatever we get from God makes us want to praise him. Some of us have our, uh, in our heads whatever we can think about God will make us praise him. But I prefer to fulfill the words of Jesus. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart does a man speak. That's why I don't mind giving God the praise because uh, he's been mighty good to me. And I understand that's the way he likes it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. If you don't mind lifting hands, uh, that's the way he likes it. If you don't mind shouting, uh, that's the way he likes it. If you don't mind running, that's the way he likes it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's why he keeps on doing great things for us. And our hearts ought to to be filled with joy. Uh, I don't mind praising him because he delights 
in our praise. Uh, he inhabits the praises of the people. Uh, and if you want God to show up, uh, I challenge you to show out in a demonstration of praise uh, and bragging on God. Uh, that word brag, uh, the word in the Hebrew uh, is in the perfect tense. That means it never should stop, but it keeps on going, keeps on going. Uh, every day of your life, you should get up in the morning, say thank you, Lord. A couple of hours later, just want to thank you, Lord. A couple of more hours later, just want to thank you, Lord. A couple more hours later, just want to thank you. God, it's late in the evening. Uh, my eyes are burning right now. Uh, but before I drift off to sleep, uh, just want to thank you one more time. Uh, do I have somebody uh, that don't mind thanking God? thanking him uh, for what he did in Jesus. Uh, see, the problem with some of us, uh, we got a David Ruffin spirit. Uh, you remember the biopic series uh, about the group known as the Temptations. Uh, Otis and the other one, the Otis in blue uh, uh, came to see David. Uh, you know, they had a few hit records, uh, had a few world tours, uh, and David was acting a fool. Uh, so they decided uh, to come to David's house uh, and to deal with him one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and David started japping. Uh, and David started being disrespectful. Uh, and he talked down to Blue and Otis. Uh, and he said, we ought to change the name uh, from the Temptations uh, to David Ruffin uh, and the Temptations. Uh, Otis says, uh, that's out of the question. Uh, that's what we're talking about here today. Uh, David jumps up uh, uh, and this still goes viral uh, and he tells Otis uh, ain't nobody coming uh, to see you Otis uh, and that's the problem um, with some people in church uh, they got a David Ruffin mentality uh, thinking the people uh, gather to see them uh, but ain't nobody uh, coming to see you Otis uh, put your name right there uh, you didn't really come uh, to hear the choir sing uh, you didn't really come uh, to hear McGee preach um, but you came uh, to get in the presence uh, of the Lord uh, I don't mind you saying uh, didn't nobody uh, come to see you McGee uh, I'm not offended um, as long as you leave uh, with an encounter with God uh, why because uh, living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away uh, but rising he justified uh, freely and forever uh, and one day uh, he's coming back uh, what a glorious day uh, that's something to brag about uh, ain't nobody uh, come to see you uh, help me preach this thing uh, turn to a neighbor uh, tell your neighbor uh, I love you uh, but ain't nobody uh, come to see you uh, I got too many problems uh, need to be solved uh, too many burdens uh, I need to bear uh, ain't nobody uh, got time uh, for some joker uh, to get in God's way uh, I came uh, to see the Lord uh, and when I come to church uh, I don't mind uh, giving him praise uh, cause down uh, through the years uh, the Lord uh, has been good to me uh, all uh, of my life uh, God uh, has been uh, 
good to me. Uh, anybody here uh, know the Miranda rights? Uh, when you get arrested, uh, the police are supposed to say uh, you have the right uh, to remain silent. Uh, anything you say uh, can and will be used against you. Uh, and some of y'all uh, come to church uh, like you're in the police station. Uh, but I declare, uh, wave your rights uh, when you come to church. Uh, wave your rights uh, and let everybody know uh, that I will, I will, I will bless the Lord. Uh, Shia! Shia! He'll take care of you. Yes, he will. Oh, yeah. You see, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. And the wild uh, can't take it away. Uh, if you got joy, uh, shout it uh, Shout it uh, out. He'll take care of you. Say, won't he do it? If you know he will, encourage somebody. Uh, I came to brag because uh, you're looking at a witness. Uh, God will, God will, uh, God will take care of you. Uh, Shout it out. Ah! That's the way he liked it. Uh-huh. 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 Oh, he do it. Take care if you know he will. Shout, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah. He'll take care of you. Excuse me, I'm just bragging on them. I'm just bragging on them. I'm just bragging on them. I hope you don't mind. I'm just bragging on them. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Ah, 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 he do it. He'll do it. He'll do it. 
do it, he'll do it. If he ain't worthy, you ain't got to say nothing. If he ain't worthy, you ain't got to do nothing. But there are enough of us here that know he's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. I know I got a right to be silent. I know I got a right to keep it to myself. But God's been so good to me. Just can't keep it to myself. And I won't let nobody stop me. Nobody wrap me up my praise. Oh, yeah. Can I get a witness? And know he's been good. Far back as you can remember. He hasn't been anything but good. Turn your bad into good. Turn your darkness into day. Yeah, you had some clouds, but they had some silver lining. And it's all because of God. It ain't your goodness, ain't your knowledge, ain't your wisdom, ain't your strength, your skills, your avant-garde that brought you to this place that where you are in your life. It was God! I know some of y'all got your praise on pause. I'm just waiting to see what the doctors say then I'm going to praise him. I'm just waiting to see what the outcome going to be then I'm going to praise him. I'll be praising him right now. I ain't got to wait for my battle to be fought. I ain't got to wait for my victory to be won. I'm going to shout right now. Let us pray. God, we glory in you. We are here according to your goodwill and pleasure, your grace and your mercy. We glory in you. We thank you for what we have, what we have achieved, what we have amassed, what we have attained. But we know that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from you, Heavenly Father, who you don't change. You're the Father of lights. You don't change like shifting shadows. You remain the same. And today we want to give you the praise. We want everybody to know this joy that we have. The world didn't give it to us. And the world can't take it away. We have everything we need for joy. May not be happy, but we sure enough got joy. Happiness is based on happenings, God. But joy is knowing that Jesus owns. And God, we come here today collectively to give you thanksgiving and praise. Hands lifted up, hearts filled with joy, tears in our eyes, oh God. Not losing sight of the fact of how good you've been to us. 
And we dare not position ourselves to petition and ask for anything without giving you a proper response to what you have already done. You've been a bill payer. You've been a door opener. You've been a door closer. You've been a shield. You've been a buckler, a strong tower. You've been more medicine. And Walgreens or CVS, Walmart or Costco, Rite Aid, any of them put together. You've been faithful. Every time we turn around, we always bumping into you. Thank you for sticking close by our sides. We got sense enough to know. We need to look at our life glass as half full. And thanking you for things as being as well as they are. And we say hallelujah anyhow. May not be ideal. May not even be appropriate. But we say hallelujah anyhow. Despite the discomfort, the confusion, we cry out hallelujah anyhow. We give you praise. Because you are greater than our ups and our downs. You're greater than our highs and our lows. You're greater than any court system, than any economic engine. You're greater than any world institution. You're greater. And because you're great, you deserve to be praised with greatness. So, we come to you with thanksgiving, supplication, joy exaltation in our hearts telling you how much we love you and appreciate you for taking an interest in us for being mindful of us for being long suffering with us for dispensing your grace and your mercy to us freely and daily that's all we want to do is give you glory and God for your glory and for our good add to the body of Christ a laborer laborers will be resourceful reliable and responsible for you do it whenever there's an assembly of baptized believers for their good, for your glory. Let not words of yours return to you void, but accomplish everything you please. God, in the name of Jesus, this is our prayer. Amen. Can you give God your best hallelujah? Now, is there somebody here that does not know the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the pardon of their sins? We extend this invitation for you to come at this time. You need to establish a relationship with God. The better your relationship is with God, the more you will understand what bragging rights means. Amen. The closer you get to God, the more you will begin to brag on him. Hallelujah. I know you're here today at the invitation of somebody so dear to you and they're dear to us as well. But the real invitation is to come to Jesus just as you are. He will save you, hallelujah, just as you are. Only trust him. Amen, just as you are. He's able. Yes, he is. He's able. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Is there somebody here today? Just come on, just come on. You, you, need, you need prayer? Just, just, just come on. Need a church home? Just come on. You, you, you want to go to heaven? 
when it's all over with, when it's a wrap down here, you want to know you're going to heaven, just, just come on, just come on. Just come on, just come on. If you're here, if you're here, if you're here, you're out of faith, you're disconnected from the church, from Christ. You got to get it right with God. You can't be thinking. You got to know. You got to know. You got to know. We can help you learn that much. Hallelujah. It won't take a lot of your time. But you got to come. You got to come. This moment, this decision, it's about you. It's about you. It's about you. It's about you. Making this about you. This part of the service is about you. If you're here today, if none, on your way to your seat, Give him your best hallelujah. Give him your best thank you, Jesus. Give him your best amen. Hallelujah.